G'day. Um, Samba is a couple of decades old now. It's been around a rather long time since a gentleman sitting in a blue shirt in the front of the room decided to avoid his PhD. Um, for a while, it was a file server, and it's gone on, and it's now many things, including Active Directory Domain Controller. In a long time, we've um, become a domain member, and we've even come up with doing continuous integration, not nearly as nicely as the OpenStack folks were, uh, but you know, we're getting there. It's an old project. You move slowly. But this gives you a bit of an idea of some of the versions that we've had and the time frame that we've been developing on, because we're going to look at some of those versions as we go through the slides. Samba is a C project. It's, we've always avoided scripting languages because, well, why does a file server need scripting? We're not a you know, desktop environment or a, you know. And C is the portable thing. I mean, even C99 is a bit dodgy. Um, so how did this happen? This is what happens when you run make test. Um, now, question for the room. How many scripting languages can you find on that screen? Uh, we've got make, we've got Python, we've got shell, Perl. Um, and these are the ones that are just involved in running our uh, test scripts. Um, and we will go a bit later into um, how we had to use them, but it's sort of interesting for a C project, we do an awful lot of scripting. But we've also been fairly timid with it. I mean, Samba's got a lot of restrictions. The places that we're trying to run, we don't necessarily have any guarantees about what's available. So the tradition has been to rely on POSIX shell, so uh, people have gone through our scripts and said, no, that's a bashism, it's got to go. Um, make, but not GNU make for many years. Uh, we've had ORC, but you've got to make sure that it works with the Solaris ORC, because uh, M4, everybody gets M4 because you've got autoconf. And of course a C compiler. So we started down this merry road, as you'd expect. You've got to have a build system for a project. So that means make and autoconf, but never automake and never libtool. Um, Autoconf kind of went mad for us. We had to be portable to multiple versions of the Autoconf templates um, because too many projects were re-autoconfing. You know, the thing that's only meant to be done on the developer master machine? Well, that was happening everywhere. And so we had to then be portable for the bit that was meant to be the portable bit. We ended up with 9,000 lines of custom M4 trying to figure out all sorts of things about the system. We also had sub-projects that we eventually made to do. We were trying to say that TDB was a sort of separate project. But the main project would directly include the M4 from the sub-project. This all got a little hairy. We also did some of the more standard things that you'd expect uh, from a project, which is you know, auto-generate a few things. So we ran ORC to go and get prototypes. This is about where I entered the project. We needed some testing. We weren't doing automated testing on a very large scale. Um, and so we started with a, um, a small testing system, uh, which was called the Build Farm. Now, because we were running this on a range of platforms, I remember working on old RX boxes, some early Solaris. Um, we had to write things in pure POSIX shell. As one of my first programming languages I was getting into, it was um, hairy and limiting. <coughs> But we ran a number of asking imported trees and uh, submitted the results back to Samba. We then processed those with a Perl script and put them up on a, um, on a web page. The actual tests that they ran, we used SED to work over some template files. And those template files, they just had all caps words that we substituted. It was in very lame, but it was enough to be able to get our very first test. So this is how Shell sort of really entered the picture in a serious way, rather than just your very trivial glue. Shell scripts have grown a lot in Samba. These graphs we're going to repeat a bit as we go through. Um, so they're the versions, much as you saw on the first graph. The oddity on the right is because Samba 4, which is the top line, has been developed in parallel with the other versions. And so uh, there is a bit of an overlap points where they, it, we actually had them both in the same tree. So it's going to look like that throughout the tree. But you'll always see these. the languages, for the most part, have kept on going up and to the right. 
For a while, we got into scripting language of the month club, a term that Tridge used in rather derisedly of, of Python at one point. We had Python bindings. The Python was the cool thing. Tim Potter was the um, object of that derision at the time. Uh, he had added Python bindings to Samba 3, but things weren't maintained, they weren't loved, and Python wasn't the fad that it, um, it became later. And these were eventually removed as just unused and broken. We also had Deja GNU TCL test scripts that were added, but also unloved and um, not automatically run and so broken and gone away. We even had Lua, which has been one of the more popular embeddable languages that was added into Samba in 2000 and, um, 2008 and removed in 2009. It was um, hoped that it could be used for asynchronous programming um, to ha handle our WinBind stuff, but it didn't make it. But the next big dependency we decided we could actually rely on on a reasonable enough number of systems was Perl. As the Samba 4 project started to take a bit of an aggressively different direction to the rest of Samba, we um, decided, look, Perl, it's not everywhere, it's not on the most ancient of systems, but look, we can probably assume Perl and it won't be too bad. So our build system started to rely on Perl. And this allowed us to move from a system that didn't have shared libraries, grouping of code, or anything that, that was in a modern build system. So the Perl worked with the make files in an odd and crazy kind of way uh, to help us with some of these challenges. But we still had autoconf, we still had M4, uh, we just added to it. So Perl, as you can see the point in the, uh, where Perl sort of became a part of the Samba project. Uh, around the sort of halfway through our, our recent development cycle. But this is the big area that we decided to take Perl in, is that once we started using it for the build system and it was available, um, an early effort for... Um, we had the idea that we could build so much of our source code from IDL. That's the way you're meant to work for a network programming language where the specification is IDL. You're meant to then convert automatically between that IDL and what you actually put into your uh, repository and what you build on. You should preferably do it at build time. So there was an early effort that Tridge um, was worked on, which was called APARSA, and it used ORC. Uh, and these awk scripts processed over the IDL files and produced the results. But uh, as I understand it, the results ended up being hand edited, little special tweaks were done, which meant that it was no longer really generated code, it was just a templated code that was sort of hacked on. Um, so that awk system never really worked out, but the ideas remain, particularly with Tridge, in thinking that there is the right way to do this. Um, and so Piddle, which was a Perl-based IDL compiler uh, of a similar age, but um, not previously used, was basically revived in um, early, about 2005 or so. Uh, and um, that IDL compiler was used as is. The results became what we used, and we put the exceptions into our IDL, so there was no, we weren't throwing the results away. Um, so throwing the generation work away uh, by hand editing. Uh, we could actually go and fix the generator for problems we found later. And we now use Piddle extensively throughout Samba. Uh, Amate uh, came up with this beautiful diagram to explain quite how many places our IDL compiler puts uh, code into Samba. We generate up uh, the C template for the server implementation, so this is the actual function called stubs, and then you go and fill in the results of what you actually need to do. Uh, we have client APIs for C, we have uh, the client Python, uh, we did generate JavaScript for a time, but it's also, we generate up multiple layers, so that as, as well as the most low level calls, we generated up a proper function call interface you could use as well. Um, and this means that a large amount of our code is auto-generated and um, is therefore very regular and is behaving the same way that um, throughout the code base. And this has been really important for allowing us to make major transformations to Samba over time. Samba, the traditional C project that you know, doesn't do scripting languages, did JavaScript. I wasn't a great fan of it when it was, it just, but it was, Tridge gave compelling reasons as to why this was the right thing to do. Um, 
In particular, the way that Truge was able to integrate an embeddable JavaScript engine into Samba uh, gave us a scripting language without these onerous dependencies because we were still very much in the, in the clutch of we can't have dependencies. Uh, this embed EJS is a particular external project of embeddable JavaScript. Uh, they actually worked with us, um, and Truge worked with them, to integrate Talloc into their system. So um, despite there being bindings between us and an external language with an external memory management system, uh, we were able to have our, um, use our internal memory management system for that. Uh, it was really quite powerful. And we had C bindings for RPC functions. So, Inside JavaScript, you could actually go and make a remote call, and that was particularly important for some of the things that we were doing. The reason that we added it to start with was that we needed a way to be able to lay out a database, and the JavaScript that we, we got did a quite a decent job of laying out a template database where you had nothing there to start with. You know your realm, you know the admin password. Well, here's everything that Active Directory needs. And so scripting became a really important part of Samba um, as we started to extend on the, on the complexity of both that and other things. So we used a lot of JavaScript, but this graph's not doing what the other graphs were doing. <sighs> Something went wrong. You see, the cool kids were using Python. <laughs> we were really quite ahead of our time for once, so we moved uh, from JavaScript to Python. And uh, once again. <laughs> yes. It was. Um, yeah, and this time, you know, Tridge was subdued, there was some chloroform involved, and a, some small lies were told about... That, you know, there's a mystical Python debugger that was going to make all of our lives easier, because we were sick of debugging this JavaScript thing that you had to basically jump into GDB and sort of figure out where you were in the JavaScript. Um, not to mention the embedded Python. Oh yes, yes, we promised that we were going to include Python into Samba so it wasn't a big external dependency that we had to rely on. That, you know, if you didn't have it, there'd be Python would be, you know, packaged with us. So, anyway, we got it in, we, you know, we were able to make the move. And Tridge has actually become quite a fan of Python. Um, he, he now programs Python in his spare time when roasting coffee beans and, um, and doing other things. And, um, and for us, working in Python, having an exception-based language has been so, so much cleaner in some of the code, business logic code that we've had to do. And our love of Python has continued. We've even gone to a Python-based build system uh, known as WAF. Uh, this has um, completely changed the way Samba's built. And, um, has, uh, and Python has really become our language. So. Uh, IDL compiler, like, we were mentioning, like I was mentioning before, IDL generation. So we now have massive swathes of Python that's generated just ready to use. If, you need, if you're writing a piece of application logic and it needs to access a remote server, well, you just say, I'd like to connect that server and, and do this remote call. It's all there. So it makes it very easy to, to walk through new things that have to be done. We've also added handwritten bindings for our key internal elements. LDB, our LDAP-like database, has Python bindings for everything that it does. Our, our TDB layer also has Python bindings. This is a lower level database layer, and it's important to be able to get to that uh, when, when we need to. Well, again, despite being a separate project that had never seen Talloc before, we've managed to integrate Talloc into Python. Uh, and so we import a Python, ob a Samba object, and say, this has been allocated with Talloc, and we give it to Python, and the right thing mostly happens. I say mostly, there is some really nasty bug that we still haven't fixed. <laughs> um, essentially, all the useful parts of Samba now can be accessed with Python. If they can't, we add it into a glue layer. It's not always the most pretty, but we can get to those functions to get our work done, and then someone hopefully helps us put it in the right place later. And we're moving towards more Python scripts. Things that we were doing in C, we're now doing in Python. For example, we've got a tool, Samba tool, that is our um, administration binary. It's sort of the, the one tool that does most things. And it went from being an all C tool to being a Python tool that wraps just C where it has to. And that slow transition has also allowed us to make it much more regular. The Python subclassing and things just brings so much more power than what we were doing in C. And Amitai was involved in a lot of that work, um, and a number of others, um, trying to get us consistent. And by you know, using a proper object-oriented language has had some great advantages. 
We've also decided that where there's a small task that needs to be done, and it's best done inside Python, we basically, uh, we have Samba fork off a small Python child that runs a script and does something. A big advantage is you can then just run that script later. As long as you use the same arguments, you can debug it, which has been really quite convenient for some things that are business logic-y stuff that weren't time critical or um, accessed for the clients, but needed to be done. And so um, that's part of our use of Python as well. So um, here you can see the Python use in Samba has skyrocketed over the, the time that Samba 4 was developed. Um, the first spike's a little bit of an oddity of the way we uh, merged our build systems together. So that's where we are today with lots and lots of Python code. And uh, as, a, as a newer member of Samba team, that's where I jumped in. So I'm going to take you on a small tour of how Python is actually being used inside uh, Samba through some of the examples. Uh, now, the first example which I, uh, which I worked on uh, soon after I joined the team was uh, we had uh, Samba 4 provisioning code which could create a DC uh, you know, and then you could join Windows, uh, Windows to it and so on and so forth. And we had uh, the old Samba 3 file server code which is working fine and people wanted to now migrate from Samba 3 to Samba 4, or rather uh, NT4 domains to uh, Windows Active Directory domains. Now, so um, we had a bit of a code which was a bit clunky, which could do some configuration migration few, uh, it could migrate some of the uh, old databases, but we didn't have a core which migrated all the users and uh, uh, groups from the old uh, uh, NT4 domain. So, and Till now, most of the Python bindings were actually developed for the Active Directory part of the uh, code base, so the, rather the uh, uh, source 4, the version 4 uh, uh, part of the code. So we first time actually added uh, Python bindings for Samba 3 code, which is the old NT4 uh, file server code, which allowed us to actually extract all the users and groups very easily from Python. And once that was done, we could actually write an upgrade script from, uh, from NT4 domain to Active Directory domain in just under two weeks. Uh, second example, which uh, Andrew mentioned, that we have now even uh, gone uh, to use Python as a build system. So uh, just to sort of give you a flavor of what uh, build rules look like, so every build rule in WAF is basically a Python function. And uh, so we have actually extended the original WAF to include a, a, a sort of a glue layer which provides easy functions so developers can uh, write, uh, create libraries or uh, create groupings as subsystems. So one of the more uh, challenging part, or rather more interesting part of uh, using Python in a build system is that it, it allows you to create all metadata as objects. So now, at one shot, you have access to all the, all the targets, their dependencies, and this allows us to do cool stuff, things like, for a library, you can actually do compile time ABI check. So let's say a developer uh, modifies some library code and tries to compile it and then once it's uh, tested and all that. Now, when actually it compiles, it not only builds the shared object, but also builds the ABI at runtime. So it takes the shared object, extracts the symbols, uses GDB to actually create the uh, signature for each ABI, and then, it compares it with the stored ones to see whether it has changed. So that alerts the developer if any of the symbol has changed, then it's time to either change the minor version or a major version. Now, if obviously the, if you have removed a symbol or a modified a symbol, then you need to up, up the uh, major version. Or if you have uh, added a new symbol, maybe you should update the minor version. Uh, so the advantage is that now developer doesn't have to worry whether any change he has made to the library code, whether it affects all the other dependencies which depend on it. So things like uh, Talak library or a TDB library, which is now used in many of the other projects. 
This is another uh, advantage which uh, we can uh, we get is similar to ABI check. Now we can do dependency tests. So if 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 you are using if you are building a binary and it uses many of the dependencies, it could be a subsystem, it could be a, 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 a library, or uh, so now you can check whether a particular symbol is coming into that binary from multiple sources. Now this allows you to detect that the same symbol is, uh, is going to get defined twice and some, it can avoid some of the very nasty bugs. Uh, uh, similarly, we can also check whether any of the symbols used in the, uh, in the Samba code actually clash with the system, any particular system library which we link with. Uh, similarly, you can do circular dependency check. Okay. So, uh, third example is basically the test framework, which is which you saw a snapshot in the beginning, which actually created uh, a jumble of whole uh, various shell scripts all together. Uh, now, it has become a quite complex architecture to understand and to to even uh, debug, you'll see in a, in a minute. Now, we do two, two kinds of tests. One is the standard unit test where uh, you test each component of the code as a library or a, a subunit. Uh, those are easy to run, you can easily debug them, no problem. But then we want to also test the behavior of the server. So as a file server or as a domain controller, we want to check whether it behaves correctly. Now, for that, we need to actually set up Samba server. We run, need to run Samba server and then run tests against it. Now, this requires that you need to set up the environment correctly. Now, as an NT4 domain, you can create a, a domain, or as an Active Directory, you can create many different types of domain controllers. So we need to create an environment for each of those types and then run tests again against them. Now, one of the issues is that we don't want to do this as root. So we want to be able to run tests as a normal user. So which means now we need a way to run multiple servers. So if you run mectest, it actually creates seven or eight oh, different. <laughs> yes. It's at least seven or eight, and it's uh, yeah, growing it, uh, as we need more combinations and, um, and more complexity. Yeah, so it creates those many different environments, and so each environment is set up as a, with a different IP address, different uh, subnet, different port, or whatever, so that we can simultaneously do all this testing, one after the other, or, and rather uh, not have different machines running different types of environments. So to do that, we have uh, socket wrappers, which basically fake the IP addresses and also fake socket connections. So all the socket connections are actually wrapped as Unix domain uh, sockets. Uh, so with these kind of uh, intricacies, it becomes difficult to actually run this test manually. So you have to uh, run this in, a, in, the, in the way the framework is set up. And that makes it also difficult to debug if, if something goes wrong in a test. So, uh, so then the question is, how do we do this testing? Okay. Uh, and once we have developed this test, uh, 18 months ago uh, or so, uh, these tests were made as part of pre-commit check, pre-merge check, so that every time uh, a commit is made, all these tests are run and uh, ensure that none of the code changes actually breaks any of the regression. This has been a, a major change to Samba's development. It's, um, the continuous integration has been a bit of a shock to the team at times, but has been um, made a massive difference to uh, the way that we develop Samba. Um, and that's a Python script. Uh, it's a fairly simple script compared to some of the others. It runs over all, the, all of our test suites uh, and then submits the job uh, into the tree. Uh, so this is how the test framework looks like. So uh, we have a bunch of tests which are uh, written in Python. So that's the test.py, which basically is a list of all the tests. So now we have, uh, uh, we use uh, test tools, uh, Python framework to uh, create those tests. 
And uh, uh, so then there is a, a Perl framework which glues everything together, which is the self-test PL. Uh, and also it sets up the environments. So the top uh, box shows here different kinds of environments, where it's a, a source 3 DC, whether uh, it's an NT4 domain, or whether it's a uh, you know, function level 2000 DC, or uh, you know, all different kinds of uh, environments. And then you have a bunch of tests. Now, a particular test either needs an environment, in, this case, in, in which case it will uh, connect to a particular uh, server and then do, run the test. Or if it's a unit test, then it will just run without any environment. And uh, so all these tests run sequentially. And the output of that is then parsed using the subunit framework. So all the tests actually use uh, extended subunit. Uh, and then the, uh, the output is presented in a nice, a nice, uh, nice and neat format. So for uh, either human consumption or uh, when it runs as a build form, which Andrew mentioned, uh, it can easily be presented as a nice web page where it shows which tests have failed and which tests have passed. So this is just a summary of uh, what I uh, mentioned. So we use test tools, uh, subunit, which is a st streaming protocol for test results. And as of now, we have about 9,000 individual tests, which are arranged as about 1,300 test suites. One of the uh, key parts of um, that makes this test framework really powerful is the, uh, the use of Python for that first layer. Being able to describe a test in terms of a series of loops, you know, for each of these environments and for each of these sets of flags run this test, uh, reduces the verbosity and that means that we can cover a lot more combinations without having to hand bang out all sorts of tests. Um, so we'll see that example uh, in the next, yeah. So yeah. here's an example of right, how do you write a test. So for those many, for multiple environments, you create a test suite. And uh, there are three arguments. The first is the name of the test. Second is the environment which you need. And third is the actual test. Now, as you can see, the test is basically a command line. So it could be written in Python, Perl, Shell. So we have a lot of tests actually uh, written in Python. Uh, there are a few in Shell, and most of them are in C. Uh, and so on the left, in the previous figure, if you see, on the left, uh, there were test.py uh, functions, which listed all the tests. And if you run them just by themselves, they generate this kind of output. So it basically defines each test independently. So you have a, a test uh, header, the name of the test, the environment, and the command line to execute that test. And th those command lines then, get the selftest.pl substitutes in those um, dollar things um, based on the environment that's specified in that second line. Uh, here is an example of test written shell. So the, so the, the, again, the first screenshot which you saw, which was the output of PS3, which showed various uh, processes was actually the result of this particular shell test, which runs a, a Samba tool, which is a Python script, through a shell script, and then interacts with a, a DC local, which is a, a local uh, uh, you know, domain controller environment. And uh, the, the contents of this sh uh, shell script looked like, you know, tested is a small function, which basically takes few arguments, but uh, it, so it, it allows you to easily write tests in uh, whatever is convenient for those particular type of tests. So whether it's a shell or whether uh, you have a torture test uh, written in C, or it could be just Python, plain Python tests. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that when you have an environment test, you need to set up the environment. And that is a bit tricky to set up because of the socket wrappers and things like that. So we have created ways in which you can set up the environment for debugging purposes. So let's say you run your make test and realize that one of the tests fails and would like to know why it fails. So one is whether the output it generated is sufficient. 
for you to figure out whether uh, what was the cause of that test failure. If not, you would like to rerun that test multiple times to see what's happening. Maybe even uh, run it through debugger. So for that, we have this test end uh, option to WAF. What it really does, it takes an optional argument of which environment you want to set up, and it sets up the environment. So that means it actually provisions that uh, DC, and then gives you a, a shell, uh, if you don't specify an X term, which basically has all the environment variables uh, set up correctly so that you can connect to that Samba server. And then you can run a particular test multiple times. And since the Samba server is running, you can even attach a debugger to the Samba server and uh, run the, uh, and debug the server code. Uh, so there are just few convenient options. And one of the most convenient options is when you are debugging remotely, is minus minus screen option, which allows you to create multiple screens for each of the sessions. So it actually creates two screens. One, in one screen, it runs the uh, server itself. And in another screen, it gives you a shell where you can run the client and mul uh, run multiple tests against the server. Okay. Now this is the last example. So we talked about uh, this build farm. So what, uh, what exactly is the build farm? And how do we actually use it? So uh, when, uh, when we actually do commits in the Samba code, it, it all run, it runs make test slightly different format, which, which is actually called auto build. And if it passes, then the code is committed or merged. But now we would like to also test that this code runs across multiple platforms, multiple OSs, so that uh, we can be sure how good the code is tested, how well the code is tested. So for that, we have uh, this build farm, which uh, now these are the machines people have uh, with spare cycles. Uh, there are various machines, various architectures, various operating systems. And each of them runs uh, a cron job. Now this cron job basically pulls the uh, build farm scripts downloads them, and then also downloads various repositories, which you want to test. So it could be uh, the bare Samba 3 code or the Samba 4 code with uh, uh, different compiler options. Could be GCC or could be a native compiler. And then it runs those tests, parses them, and then uploads them onto a central site where uh, which is the central site, which is the build.samba.org, where you can see the results of, of these tests on various machines. So we're not really a C project after all, uh, but at least we're not C++. Uh, so on that note, we wonder if there were any questions. Yeah. Okay, up on the left. Okay. Sorry, hard to see people in the light. Um, so I noticed you set up a number of environments for testing against. Do you reuse those environments or are they set up freshly for each test? No, we have to reuse them because they can take a couple of minutes to set up. Okay. Um, and so at an hour and a half, uh, our test week is long enough without um, re-seeing re them up. This does create some, some challenges if um, the environments, if the tests corrupt each other. Uh, but it's the only choice we really have. Do you have a deterministic test order? Yes, the, the test order is deterministic and we have a way of running uh, on a subset of the tests, which sometimes helps when one triggers in another. You can, if you can guess what they are, you can run the, just the two of them, which is better than waiting an hour and a half for the next failure. Oh, good. Has anyone else got any questions? Absolutely no one. Okay. I think we'll wrap it up now. Okay, now on behalf of the conference team, I would like to thank you two very, very much for your effort and your time. Thank you. And thank you.